everyone welcome to today's British Science Week event what you should know about the climate traje trajectory of the poles which is going to be presented by Professor Mark Brandon and the Open University's Faculty of STEM. We do have two more talks this week tomorrow we have a talk on using gaming to teach cybersecurity and then on Friday uh, we have John Golding and Professor David Mayle giving a talk on all of the COVID vaccines, how they work, and dispelling some myths on them. So please get involved in today's discussion. Uh, you can use the chat or comment section on social media. Um, and definitely pop questions in there that you've got for Mark. Um, I'll be relaying those to him after his presentation today. Uh, if, if you need to run off or um, have, you know, think somebody could really benefit in watching this, um, you can find the recording right away on YouTube and on Facebook. All right, I will hand over to Mark now without any further ado. Thank you very much, Katrina. And hello, everyone. It's hopefully Katrina will confirm that you can now see my screen OK. Um, well, I looked at my uh, diary, actually, and the last time I gave a face to face talk was uh, 53 weeks ago. So what a year we've had. Um, and it's good to get the opportunity now. Now, I'm going to talk about where what, what I think you should know about where the climate is going in the Arctic and the Antarctic um, and what we should worry about. And there's a lot of uh, media stories which I'll talk about. I thought it was worth pointing out in the beginning where, why I'm interested in it. Um, I've always been interested in the cold. Uh, that's me in the shorts on the right hand side. Um, my sister was a bit of a wuss, so she had to wear long trousers, but hey, we were kids then. And of course there was more snow in the seventies, wasn't there? Um, from growing up to be a kid, uh, I worked in the uh, Scott Polar Research Institute and I worked on Arctic oceanography. Uh, and that's a picture of the German ship Polar Stern from a helicopter uh, flying towards it. Um, and there's a picture of me as a, as a young fella um, in the cold. Uh, I picked a very stupid topic to work on. It was how the ocean freezes in winter, which meant I had to go in the winter, which meant it was horrifically cold. And for the first month I was there, the average temperature was about minus 40. Um, and we, minus 40 centigrade, minus 40 Fahrenheit is sort of the same thing. Um, and I went to the edge of ice flows. Um, the, uh, the stuff on the left-hand side that looks all sorts of ridged is older ice that's much thicker. And the stuff on the right, which looks quite smooth uh, and quite, uh, yeah, quite flat and smooth, that's, sea, uh, that's where it was open water, but it's just frozen over again. So I broke through that and then lowered the instrument that you can see my partner working with. Um, it was very dangerous for all sorts of reasons. One of the reasons it was dangerous is uh, there are lots of vicious animals around in the Arctic, um, and that's a polar bear footprint. Um, I often get asked, did you see any bears? Um, well, it's the other way around. They come looking for you because you smell interesting. And when you smell interesting, you're good to eat. Um, so that means whenever you go out, you have to be uh, armed. Um, but of course, being British, uh, you can see we've carefully balanced the rifle uh, on a milk crate pointing away from us safely. Uh, and in the distance, in the background on the left hand side, you can see my polar bear guard who uh, should have been guarding us with the rifle, but instead was taking photographs. So that was nice of him. Um, nowadays, of course, you'd be pleased to know that it's uh, a lot more, uh, we're a lot more safety conscious and we're much better trained. Um, of course, I've worked in the Antarctic as well. <clears throat> After the Scott Polar Research Institute, I worked at the British Antarctic Survey before the Open University. Um, and you also get stalked by all sorts of vicious animals there. Uh, vicious penguins um, and the penguins protecting its chick. Um, uh, but more worrying uh, if you work around in the Antarctic are fur seals. And the fur seals are fantastically territorial. Uh, and this is a picture on South Georgia. Um, and they look like that. Um, they, everyone thinks they look quite cute when they're young, um, but don't be fooled. They're, they're very savage animals. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't go near them. So, so I'm sort of a polar person, but I'm constantly surprised these days uh, by the sorts of media stories that come out constantly about uh, where we are in the planet and what's going to happen. 
So the Guardian of uh, sea ice will raise, uh, melting Antarctic ice will raise sea level by two and a half meters. Uh, heat wave in Antarctica melted 20% uh, of, of an island snow in just nine days. Uh, West Antarctica melting, it's all our fault. Um, uh, another example of this sort of thing, world's largest iceberg near collision with South Georgia could imperil penguins. Uh, and in the Guardian, Arctic heat wave triggers climate meltdown fears. And I kind of, I kind, I kind of thought, well, as an expert, I think I understand these these stories and what they mean. But I wondered, as as people who didn't know much about uh, the polar regions from a professional uh, uh, point of view, if they could understand them. And uh, my favourite recent one was this, which was just uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, where it talked about uh, fear over ice shelf melting. And it talks about an ice shelf in Antarctica. Um, and it talks about it being, uh, the, the melt was la larger last year than it was for 31 summers, but it doesn't even say where the ice shelf is. Um, and there are quite a lot of ice shelves in Antarctica. Um, there's the shape of Antarctica. Uh, I'll stick around the edge of it. Uh, there are all the ice shelves. So what this story is saying is that one of those ice shelves has melted quite a lot. But what does that mean and what is it important or isn't it important? And so um, I thought I'd try and explain that. Now, it wouldn't be fair to talk about this stuff without making the point that the confusion sometimes about what's actually going on in the polar regions is quite deliberate. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I, I first went to the Antarctic in 1992. Um, and that's a newspaper headline on the left hand side, a front page from the Daily Express from 2009. Um, the one on the right from the Telegraph from 2011, when we had just shown Frozen Planet, which was a BBC OU co-production. Um, and there have been lots of media organisations that have, have, or some people in media organisations have worked quite hard to, to make it confusing, I think. Um, and so that's the sort of subtext. So I thought, well, where, where are we? Well, just after I joined the British, uh, the Open University, the British Antarctic Survey uh, came up with this, this leaflet and it showed the state of ice shelves in the Antarctic, on the Antarctic Peninsula. Now, all the ones in red when this was published were, had already disintegrated. So they had already gone by 2003. And then it marks out some other ones as retreating. Uh, and that one uh, ice shelf was completely unchanged. Well, if you look since 2003, uh, the ones that it had as uh, retreating, those ones in yellow, have now all turned to disintegrated. And the one that was marked as unchanged, uh, that one there is the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf. And the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf uh, had this giant iceberg car from it. Uh, called A68, and I'll talk about A68 a bit further along. Now, 20 years ago, we were still understanding the climate on the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, now, this is our understanding of it. That's the climate on the Antarctic Peninsula. On the left-hand side is a map. On the right-hand side, there is a, a mean atmospheric annual temperature. And the red line is the critical one, the minus nine degrees mean annual temperature. If an ice shelf is north of that minus the nine degrees uh, line, it's not viable. We understand now from basic physics and, it's in, and, and it will go. If it's the, the south of that line, then it's still much colder. So that side of the line too warm, uh, that side of the line, it's too cold. And then we can actually see that if you look at the, the, the uh, ice shelves that I showed that are disintegrated, they're all on the side that's too warm. So this stuff is a long way away. How does it connect with us in the UK? Why should we care about it? Oh, there's lost and see. Well, this is a famous picture of the 100th closure of the Thames Barrier in 2006. Now I'm a Londoner, so uh, and my dad actually worked on the Thames Barrier being built. So it's got a place close to my art. But to see it uh, close is quite an impressive thing. If you look at the numbers of closures, uh, the columns are the, for each decade. So eight closures from 1982 to 1990, 31 closures for 1991 to 2000, 80, 
And the, my data here only goes up to 2017, but we were already at 60 with still four years left. And now we're past 2020. I always intended last year to update this. And for some reason over the last year, I got distracted. But the Thames barrier is closing more and more and more. And that's because sea level rise is coming from Antarctica and Greenland uh, and the glaciers on our planet. Plus the ocean is expanding. And so it's gonna affect us that way. Um, if you look on the banks of the River Thames, this is the UK Environment Agency. Uh, that's where the wall was in 1879. That was where it was in the end of the 19th century. And then in 1928 and 1930, they realized that it was still rising. So they had to put the flood act in and put coping stones on the top. Those walls and the Thames barrier were all planned for. And we're going to have to respond again in the context of what's happening in the polar regions. So you'll have seen this, uh, plan this picture a lot. This is the the, the, the atmospheric temperature record, oh, sorry, atmospheric carbon dioxide record from Mauna Loa, which is uh, in Hawaii. And it's showing that atmospheric carbon dioxide has increased from about 310 parts per million up to 410, which is quite a lot. On the horizontal axis, it goes from 1958 through to current days. If we go back in time, the bit I've shaded in red was in the previous plot. So if we now go back to the start of the Industrial Revolution, or just before that really, to 1700, you can see that the rise has only really come uh, in this century and then after, of last century now, I'm showing my, showing my age, um, and after 1950. If we go back again, it, further in time, again, the red is what I showed in the previous plot. The flat line that goes all the way across about 270 parts per million, is, is the atmospheric con concentration and on the horizontal axis, I've got thousands of years. So you can see it's been a slow increase over 10,000 years. 10,000 years is basically the length of all human civilization. Um, and then if we go back even further in time, now on the time axis, on the horizontal axis, it goes back 800,000 years. And the red is the color from the previous plot. You can see that actually carbon dioxide now is much higher than it's ever been. Uh, well ever been since humans have been on our planet. And it's worth making the point that um, we are, uh, oh, it, when, it's, uh, when our atmospheric carbon dioxide is low, we have ice ages uh, and the ice has advanced on our planet. When it's warm, we have uh, warmer periods and the ice has retreated on our planet and that's affected sea level. Um, and worth making the point that we're all the way up here um, because we've put so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That's where we are. What does the atmospheric carbon dioxide do? Well, there's a lovely uh, graphic from Kevin Park, uh, and it shows that on the vertical axis, global mean temperature, on the horizontal axis, carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere. And you can see that as carbon dioxide increases on our planet, then that means that uh, the global mean temperature increases. That's where we are. So let's look at our planet. On the left-hand side, I've got the Arctic. On the right-hand side, I've got the Antarctic. The colors there, the yellow shades, are amount of sea ice covering the ocean. It's called uh, the sea ice extent. And I've called it a heartbeat. The date is in the top left-hand corner for each plot. And you can see that uh, it's going through the year 2018. And I chose 2018 just because that's a complete year of data. Now, there are satellites orbiting uh, our planet and they can get this data for every single day uh, by about um, probably 3 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. But I'll be able to download yesterday's data. But you can see that as we get towards the summer in 2018, on the left hand side, the Arctic sea ice is almost at a minimum, whereas on the right hand side plot, you've got the Antarctic sea ice, which is now growing to a maximum. As we go to September, the Arctic is absolutely at a minimum, Antarctic is at a maximum. And then as we go through to the Arctic winter, the Arctic sea ice grows and the Antarctic sea ice retreats. So it's kind of like a heartbeat, Arctic, Antarctic, Arctic, Antarctic. So let's start with the Arctic. The Arctic, Arctic is on the left-hand side and it's got this uh, wonderful uh, ocean, really, the Arctic Ocean surrounded by land. And the Antarctic is a land surrounded by ocean. So they're almost an inverse of each other. 
Now, if you look at what's happening in the Arctic, we know that when we've added carbon dioxide to our temperature, to, to our atmosphere, the temperature on our planet has increased. Um, you've got years at the bottom from 1880 to through to 2020. Um, and the black line is the uh, global mean temperature. So that's the temperature on the planet across the whole globe. And you can see that from 1880, it's increased by about one degree centigrade. But the red line is the Arctic, and that's uh, uh, everything above 60 degrees north. And you can see that um, actually most of the warming has occurred in the Arctic compared with the rest of the planet. And for as, as the planet continues to warm, we expect, uh, we're quite sure actually, that the Arctic is going to increase in, in temperature more than the rest of the planet. We call it Arctic ampl amplification. And that has a, an obvious effect on the cryosphere. The cryosphere is what we call the cold parts of the planet. This is the sea ice that you can see I showed you previously. Now, what I did to make that plot on the right is I picked the 10th of September from 1989 to 1993. So those uh, six years, for every, uh, for every year on the 10th of September, and I averaged them all together. So on that plot on the right-hand side, you've got the mean sea ice extent in the Arctic uh, geographically for that period. And you can see in the graph on the left-hand side, I've shaded in red the, the area, um, the region of the graph I'm talking about. Now, if you look at a more recent period, this is 10th of September 2018, and you can see that there's much less uh, sea ice in the Arctic. Now, I can actually take one de data set away from the other and find out just how different they are. And so if I take away 1989 to 1993 from 2018, where it says red, those red plot uh, shades on the right hand side, you can see there's a lot less sea ice than there was uh, in the early part of the record. And where there are blues, it's a bit heavier. But by and large, as you would expect, looking at the graph on the left hand side, there's been a gradual de decrease of sea ice all the way through the Arctic as we've gone on in time. And we expect that to carry on. Uh, another way of looking at that on the horizontal axis, we've got time from the start of the, uh, the satellite record. On the vertical axis, from the top downwards, January, February, March, April, May, down through to December. And each month has a color and, and, and the dates have colors. And you can see that as you go from left to right on that plot from 1979 through to 2000 through to 2020, the blues are changing into reds. And you can see that the Arctic uh, sea ice extent anomalies are getting more and more red, which is less and less ice compared to the early part of the record. So we know the amount of uh, ocean uh, that's covered by sea ice in the Arctic is decreasing quite a lot. Uh, we also know that as the sea ice extent is decreasing, the volume of the sea ice is also decreasing as well. And you can see that the volume on the right hand side. Now, as the Arctic sea ice is decreasing, that's just one part of the cryosphere. Other parts of the cryosphere are snow cover. Snow cover in the spring is in significant decline. As the temperature warms, the snow melts more early, and we can see that snow, uh, snow cover is actually melting earlier and earlier. And the plot on the right shows the, the mass in gigatons. That's quite a lot, a large number, but you can see it's clearly going down. And we're talking in, in September. 13% less sea ice per decade, uh, sorry, 13% less snow per decade, which is a huge number. Uh, and in May, it's 5%. So there's less at the end of the winter, the, the decrease is less at the, at, the end, at the end of the winter, most in the summer and, and less in the autumn, but it's, it's definitely decreasing. So what are the impacts of that decreasing uh, snow cover? Well, they're actually really quite wide. Um, here's an example of that. Um, a recent piece of work by some Polish authors, uh, lots of polar animals like Arctic foxes and weasels, they grow white fur coats in winter and then they molt in the win at the end of the winter and go back to dark and it acts as uh, cam camouflage. What these authors uh, showed is that 
the climate change and the retreat of the snow means that the, the weasels are not shedding their coats until much later in the year, which means that they're white against the green, which means that they're more easy for predators to catch. And that's just one example of the sorts of things that I worry about. Um, so that's an important effect and that is going on in the Antarctic as well. Um, to make the point here, the, I've talked about the sea ice decrease, the solid uh, red line that you can see in the center of the plot is what we call a reconstruction. It's not an actual measurement of the sea ice extent over the last 1400 years, but it's our best understanding of it. The red shading either side of the solid red line is how, how certain we are of that measurement. So you can see it's quite wide, the, the range of, of uncertainty. But the blue dots on the right hand side are our modern observations, which are the satellites that I've just shown you. Uh, and some other uh, understanding of sea ice extent, which comes from uh, observations from ships and things. And you can see that they match up quite well, but this plot makes the point that the sorts of changes we're seeing in the sea ice, which also equates to the changes we're seeing in the snow, and also, as I'll show you in a moment, in the Greenland ice cap, are, are sort of unprecedented over what we understand over the human uh, existence. So you can see that it's way, way off. Um, yeah, and we're there. Um, now there's a satellite called GRACE and GRACE has, uh, yeah, now we can see, uh, GRACE uh, measures the gravity of Greenland, which means that you can infer the ice loss. And you can see that um, as the graph is going along in time on the right-hand side, the colors are changing on the left-hand side, which shows you how much ice is being lost from Greenland. And yeah, they're very large numbers. Uh, 3000 gigatons we're up to now. Um, we're heading towards four. This record goes up to uh, 2016. But you can see that all around the edges of Greenland, the ice is in, the, the ice is, is uh, we're losing mass from Greenland and that mass loss is turning into uh, seawater, it's flowing into the seawater, which is increasing sea level which is affecting us. Um, what is the impact of, 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 of that uh, uh, loss on Greenland? Well, there was a story in a science journal called uh, Nature uh, talking about climatology on thin ice and how uh, glaciologists uh, will struggle because their subjects are actually melting away. Um, and I went on Twitter and I tweeted, yeah, the bit I did my PhD on has gone. It has already. Um, there's no chance of doing the work that I did my research on at the start of my career because it doesn't exist. And that got picked up by the BBC and they spun it as uh, glaciology jobs on thin ice, which wasn't really the sorts of angle that I was uh, hoping for in the story, but it's a view, of course. The sea ice is retreating. The snow is getting uh, uh, decreasing and it's melting earlier. We've also got loss of, of, of ice from Greenland. What are the other impacts? Well, as the uh, uh, snow is retreating earlier, the discharge of rivers into the Arctic is actually increasing as well. So the great Russian rivers uh, around the edge and the Canadian and Alaska rivers, on the right hand side, you can see um, time at the bottom and it's upwards. There's more and more uh, fresh water flowing into the Arctic Ocean, which is going to change it. As the temperatures have gone up, you can detect with satellites and remote sensing um, that, uh, that there's an increase uh, of non-frozen seasons. The land is, is thawing up earlier, and that means that there are impacts on vegetation growth. Um, and some lovely work done by uh, uh, Boston University has shown that there has been a 10% growth increase in Arctic plant growth over the last 30 years. And this is actually going to carry on. It's quite astonishing numbers, really. Uh, in places, it's highly regional, but it's linked to uh, regional climatology, which is linked to sea ice and things. So all these things are happening in the Arctic. So now let's make the point that the Arctic is not isolated anyway. Now, what we've got here is a plot of samples from uh, ringed seals, which is a prey of polar bears and from polar bears. And there, there are the two colors and the heights of the bars show the amount of something called PBDE, 
which is within the polar bear and the seal fat. PBDE is a fire retardant, so it was only manufactured in, in, in sofas and things like that. It's now banned, but it was manufactured in sofas to stop them catching fire. So what this demonstrates is that things that we put in uh, our, our furniture end up in the Arctic. Now, because the, uh, uh, the, the Arctic is warming uh, much more quickly than the rest of the planet, um, we can understand that there has been Arctic amplification in temperature, and that is affecting the middle latitude weather. On the planet, the winds are fairly complicated, but we have, if we have a very stable uh, polar vortex, then what that means is that the cold air is, is kept mostly to the Arctic. But where it changes, where the temperature between the equator and the pole varies, it's putting different forces on that jet stream and it starts to wobble and oscillate. And where it oscillates, it can drag cold air very much further south and warm air very much further, so further north. And we think we're seeing that. So worth making the point here that um, Britain is actually uh, the furthest north uh, nation that's not part of the Arctic, uh, the Arctic Council to manage the Arctic, but it's only just over 300 nautical miles from the Shetlands to the Arctic Circle. So these variations in the jet stream have huge impact on us. Now, if you think back to uh, a year ago, in February, it was uh, in February 2020, it was fantastically wet because we had persistent rain over us. and We were about 300 percent in places more than the average over the last 30 years. In May, it was almost a complete reverse. We got a fraction of the amount of rainfall, and that's because of this jet stream wobbling. And we expect things like that to happen more in the near future. Um, as the Arctic sea ice decreases, something that we're often told is it's going to be wonderful because ship marine traffic will be able to transit through the Arctic uh, and it will make it a whole lot easier to get around. Um, and it will mean goods will be uh, uh, much more e uh, easy to transport across the planet. But if marine traffic increases, uh, what about on land? There's actually quite a lot of people that live on land, and you might have seen the TV series Ice Road Truckers. Um, in that TV series, all of those roads uh, thaw out very early, and it means that it's really hard for people to get around. And the final thing about as the ice retreats in the Arctic is it's filled with resources, lots of petrochemicals, lots of minerals, and all of those things become more available. So then we come into the question of who owns the Arctic. Um, and again, these are things that I worry about a lot. Um, uh, back in uh, 2007, I think it was, the Russians actually uh, took Mir, one of their little tiny submarines, out to the Arctic. And over the North Pole, they went down to the seafloor and they put a Russian flag at the North Pole on the seafloor. And they claimed that that meant that it was Russian territory. Now, international law is a whole lot more complicated than that but it was funny to see. Um, and just after that happened uh, in the Times in 2007, uh, someone I used to work with at the Scott Polar Research Institute uh, published this in the Times newspaper. And this newspaper article, he, Bob was working on, on a ship as a lecturer. Um, and he said uh, he took a coin from the realm, a British coin, and dropped it over the side of the ship at the North Pole. So a British national symbol with an image of the Queen has been on the seabed 16 years before a Russian flag. But the killer is the bit in the last sentence. Perhaps their sovereign importance is equal. So does it matter if you put a flag on the seafloor at the North Pole to claim it? Well, there's a lot of legal people working on those questions and also geologists too. That's a whole other story. So lots of things going on in the Arctic. What about in the Antarctic? Well, one point to make about Antarctica straight away is it is unbelievably huge. This is the latest satellite data, which shows the flow of the ice from the center of the Arctic towards the coast, where it's purple color, it's flowing very, very quickly, the ice, and it's like rivers basically flowing towards the coasts. And when the ice reaches the coast, then the ice breaks off and you get giant icebergs coming away. 
Now, it's almost impossible for the media to mention Antarctica without using the phrase coldest and windiest continent. And uh, yeah, so there's 91,000 results on Google when I did this search. Um, it is cold in Antarctica. But Antarctica is really big and it doesn't have a consistent climate. The red, you can see the size of it. Green is uh, Europe. And I've got Antarctica laid out over the top of Europe there. So you can see just how big it is. Would you expect Iceland to have the same climate as the south of Italy? Obviously not. So let's see what that looks like in Antarctica. When we look at the red dots, I've got South Pole and I've got Vostok Station, which is a Russian station, and Adelaide Island, which is a British station. Temperature on the vertical axis. And I've just picked two years at the bottom, just random years. And you can see that the, at the Vostok, which is uh, in the center of the continent, you can see the temperature goes down between in winter goes down to minus 60 to minus 70 degrees centigrade, uh, and then comes up to minus 30 degrees in the summer. If you look at Adelaide Island, then it's sort of zero to minus 15. So that makes the point that the climate across Antarctica isn't uh, the same. It isn't all the coldest and windiest. Some parts of Antarctica are very cold and very windy, but some of them are just not. Now, the key thing about Antarctica and climate is warm water reaches the Antarctic continent. And what you see here is the map of Antarctica. The colors, the red colors uh, in the ocean are ocean temperature. So there's reds and blues. And you can see that on the left hand side of the plot where it says the Bellingshausen Sea and the Amundsen Sea, it's quite red. Uh, and that's warmer temperatures on the right hand so side of the plot. Uh, it, the, the ocean parts tend to be a darker blue, which means colder water. On the land, the colors represent how much the elevation of the ice is changing. Now, how do we work that stuff out? Let's show this animation. If we zoom in to one particular part of Antarctica, the red color is the speed of the ice flowing towards the ocean. I'll show you a cross section along that line. And you can see you've got ice there, the ocean and the seabed. Now, warm water flows towards the ice. It melts the bottom of the ice sheet, uh, and then the ice surface actually lowers. And when the ice shelf lowers, you can actually measure that quite easily if you've got a couple of billion dollars worth of satellites. What do we find? Well, the red colors now on land, you can see that they correspond on the left-hand side, the red colors on land show how much the elevation has gone down. On the right hand side is a piece of work which converted how much that drop is equivalent to in melting ice. And you can see each one of those big red circles represents how much gigatons of ice has been lost from the edge of Antarctica. And all that's being driven by the ocean heat. Actually, when I first uh, started working at the OU, that was a piece of work that I did uh, to work out how much heat from the ocean was flowing towards that ice. Overall, I showed you this picture for uh, Greenland. Now let's show you from uh, Antarctica. These are the GRACE observations, so the, the, the ice mass loss from Antarctica. You've got time again on the horizontal axis and mass loss in gigatons on the vertical axis. And you can see as we go further along in that time, we go down and down and down. And of course the punchline is, the trajectory of that line isn't going to change anytime soon. So we're going to carry on losing ice from Antarctica into the ocean, and that is going to affect our sea level. One obvious part of that is that we get uh, ice shelf collapse. Talked about this earlier, but you can see that uh, on the right hand side, I've marked out the Larsen. There's an old satellite uh, set of satellite data, I say old from 2020 which shows how quickly the ice shelf actually broke up over a period of months um, and it basically shattered. Understanding that uh, ice shelf breakup is a huge amount of work going on in, in glaciology and also in mathematics and, and physics to understand that. And that's a piece of work that uh, I've been involved in. Um, and we think that over the next hundred years, or not think, it's not think we've calculated, over the next 100 years, the sea level rise from Antarctica is likely around 45 centimetres. 
But that's just from Antarctica. It doesn't include Greenland. It also doesn't include from the glaciers. And it also doesn't include the ocean warming up because as the ocean warms up, it expands as well. So that's just the Antarctic part of it. Now, this story in the context of what you should understand about the poles is carrying on. We're going to carry on losing this uh, ice from Antarctica into the ocean. And it can feel quite uh, scary the way this stuff is reported. Uh, this is an article that was published a couple of years ago by a really good author, actually, uh, called Ice Apocalypse. Um, and they really, uh, he really worked hard on, on making people scared, really. Uh, I spoke with more than a dozen polar scientists. Nearly all of them had that edge in their voice. They knew their core, that this work was critically important and they wanted the world to know. Um, yeah, well, we do, but I, yeah, maybe they were not the people I work with. Um, and it got picked up massively. Uh, Chelsea Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, daughter, talks about harrowing Reed, and it got picked up by lots of people about precariousness of Antarctic glaciers. Now, I'm, I'm not a catastrophist. I don't think it's a good idea to say we're doomed, because if you say we're doomed, um, then it's very easy for people to turn around and say, well, it's not worth bothering doing anything. And I disagree with that massively. So within the UK, a British scientist, a really good one, uh, a, a researcher down in King's College, Tamsin Edwards, who used to work at the Open University, uh, published this, which was called How Soon Will the Ice Apocalypse Come? Um, and it got to be a colourful debate. Eric wrote that um, Tamsin argued that what we do, it's up to humanity to choose the sea level path the planet takes. The more we study Antarctica, the more we'll be able to refine these scenarios. That's the point. But the key thing is what Tamsin says, um, our choices are for sea level up or up even more. That's where we're going. That's what we're going to have to cope with. And that's the thing that we're, we're concerned about. Um, so, yeah, back to this story that was in uh, quite recently, on February the 26th, Fear Over Ice Shelf. Well, which ice shelf was it? Well, it turns out uh, Dr. Alison Banwell, uh, someone I'd written a paper with, wrote this really good journal article uh, about the King George VI ice shelf in Antarctica. And the George VI ice shelf is actually where I've got my red arrow pointing to there. And from her journal article, you can see there it's got it marked out and you can see on the left hand side of that plot, it's exactly the region where we would could expect the ice shelf to be melting. But what she is showing is that the, the, the surface melt from satellite data has increased and the yellow star on that plot is from an automatic weather station. And one of the brilliant things I love about this paper is it's done entirely not in Antarctica, it's done using remote sensing data and from historical data. You can do this from this sort of uh, work, a lot of this stuff from your desk, even during what we've had to endure. But the key thing is this fantastic paper is about that area in the yellow box, which as you can see from my red line, the minus nine degrees, the mean annual temperature, it's a place where we expect ice shelves to be quite marginal anyway. And I think it's likely that in, in the near future, uh, the King George VI ice shelf will completely disappear, which is a shame because it's a beautiful location. I've been there a couple of times. Um, and then there's this piece of work, a lovely paper from uh, Anna Hogg uh, and uh, Hilmar Goodman Johnson. And uh, it, there was a giant iceberg which carved and it carved uh, from the Larsen Sea ice shelf. And what you're looking at now is a satellite image. On the left-hand side is the, is, is the ice shelf, Larsen C, and you can see the crack grow across. And Anna put this beautiful video together showing it. And you can see as time goes on and on and on, we get closer and closer to the ice shelf. Now, Anna was one of the people looking carefully at this ice shelf, and she knew that when it would carve, it would form one of the biggest uh, icebergs that we'd ever seen. And so when we get there in July, it broke free and we got this giant iceberg. And as we zoom out, you'll see it quite well. Uh, the cracks are still continuing to grow. 
and the dark blue bit is where the iceberg is, the yellow bit is ice shelf, and there it is moving away. And then as we zoom out, you get an idea of just how huge this thing is. And this was just after the iceberg collapsed, uh, went, went, fractured and broke off of the Larsen Sea ice shelf. Now I had done some work on these giant icebergs uh, back in 2010 um, in an article where uh, John Amos uh, wrote that South Georgia Island is the place where giant icebergs go to die. Now the island on the left-hand side there is 110 kilometers long. So those two icebergs are about 40 kilometers long. Um, and yeah, you can see I was very eloquent in my uh, earlier part of my career. The scale of the icebergs is something else. That's a good quote from me there. Um, but what I did make the point is that that iceberg was going to end up uh, at South Georgia because that was the same currents that took Shackleton across the ocean towards uh, South Georgia. Now, because I'd done this work, um, I found myself uh, doing all sorts of media stuff on telly, which was a bit weird. Um, and yeah, having to explain to people about what, what it meant. Now, everyone wanted to understand this giant iceberg as a story about climate change. And it was actually, you know, the climate was causing this ice shelf to, to self-destruct. But it wasn't, it was a giant ice shelf, iceberg carving. So it was a natural geophysical process. Uh, amazing to see, unbelievably amazing. The really big issue is what would happen to the ice shelf now this big iceberg had broken free because the stresses and strains in the ice that was remaining change and is the ice shelf still viable and Swansea University uh, some researchers there have been doing some work on that and what they've shown is where other ice shelves have completely broken away the glaciers flowing into the ice shelves have speeded up which has increased the rate of sea level rise um, and yeah, it got picked up um, and yeah, Freezy does it, trillion ton iceberg uh, careering out of control after breaking away from Antarctica. And helpfully, uh, one of my colleagues, Dave Rothery, uh, <laughs> noted the point, careering out of control. Uh, this is in contrast to icebergs that have someone at the helm, which is kind of a nice point. Um, and there's where La uh, A68 went. It broke off on the left-hand side and traveled all the way up to South Georgia the light blue squiggles in that plot are the historic iceberg tracks and they whizzed up to South Georgia. So we had a fair idea of where it would go. Um, this is a wonderful movie from Steph Lermite, which you can see on the right hand side in the red square, the iceberg. The things that are whizzing across the, the image are actually clouds. And that's why you can't see them. We're getting towards Antarctic winter. And you can see the iceberg breaking free, slowly moving up going around the top of the Antarctic Peninsula and it gets stuck for a little bit and then you'll see it whiz towards South Georgia very soon as we come into the autumn and there it starts to move. Now when you think this iceberg is about 110 kilometers long there it is heading towards the island and that's where we were it was very close and it grounded and the British Antarctic Survey sent a team up to do some research on it. Um, yeah, and then the news was fun. Uh, A68 iceberg on collision path uh, could imperil penguins, scientists to study runaway Antarctic iceberg threat. But that's part of a natural sort of thing. And it happened has happened at South Georgia, you know, thousands of times before in history of South Georgia Island and penguin colonies, and it will happen again. Um, how it affects individual penguins could be very, very bad, but how it affects uh, the actual uh, all of the penguins of South Georgia, I don't think it will wipe the ball out. Um, so coming into the last part of my talk, how do we understand what's going to happen to the changes on our planet? Well, you may have heard of the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degrees centigrade. Well, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had this report on 1.5 degrees C, uh, and they agreed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C. Um, now, what does 1.5 degrees centigrade mean? Um, well, it can mean two things. Firstly, it means that you go up slowly at 1.5 degrees C and you meet it and you just touch it like the plot on the left hand side. Or you can overshoot it and come back. So we have to understand that if we go over and come back, that has quite different consequences for the wildlife and the geophysics that's going on in the polar regions. Um, this is the summary from that report. On the vertical axis, you've got temperature. 
on the horizontal axis, we've got time. And let's break it down. Since pre-industrial, that's before we started making things, um, we've caused about one degree centigrade of global warming. So we trace across the green line, that one degree centigrade is what we've caused. The light green that I've shaded there is how well we know that number. So it could be 1.25 degrees C, could be 0 0.8 to 1.25 degrees C, but it's, it's approximately one degree across the planet. Now, if we look up the line and we project that up, the current rate of warming, 0.2 degrees centigrade per decade, you can see that we're gonna reach 1.5 degrees C by about 2040. If you color in the shading there, it will actually be in the range of 2030 through to 2052. And that's when we're gonna reach this 1.5 degrees C, which is almost tomorrow. I mean, it's a blink, we'll be there. I've shown this plot previously. That 1.5 degrees C refers to global mean surface temperature. In the Arctic, we are certain that it will increase more. So we're gonna see more impacts. Um, a key message from the report, we're going to uh, global mean sea level, if we stick to 1.5 degrees C, we'll get about 10 centimetres uh, of, of sea level rise less compared to 2 degrees centigrade. But we're very certain that sea level rise is going to carry on rising past 2100 because of the sorts of data that I've been showing you um, and the way it the way it rises depends on what choices we make right now. Um, when you express confidence in these measures, it's a very tricky thing, but we're very, care very careful in how language is used. Uh, if we're the, the things that go into confidence are how uh, consistent the evidence is and how we agree with it. So if you read that statement again, with medium confidence, we're going to save 10 centimeters if we keep global warming to 1.5 degrees C. We've got medium confidence, but we're pretty certain that it's going to carry on all the way up. So I'll finish up with this. Um, I am an optimist and I'm an optimist. I can't really say why I'm an optimist. It's difficult. Um, but um, so David Attenborough gave this uh, talk in uh, the Commission Science Committee in the business uh, a couple of years ago. And he was asked by an MP, do you wish you'd have spoken out earlier about the climate? And David's reply is, is really interesting. He says, we didn't know, we really didn't know. 50 years ago, it seemed inconceivable. I didn't believe we could change the climate. Now, um, I'm 53 uh, and when I got and first started working on the polar regions, it was obvious to me what, what had happened um, or what's, what, what the trajectory was. And I think it's true to say that all we've done since then is, is make our answers more accurate. But what we see is in the context of not knowing 50 years ago and where we are now, um, I don't think we can ignore this sort of thing. In 2009, the Daily Express was saying global warming is natural, we, we're not to blame. And then uh, yeah, February the 8th this year, Daily Express joined the Green Britain revolution to boost the environment, almost a whole issue where this, this, the Daily Express is talking about uh, climate and how to make things better. So it just shows you it takes time. Um, we're gonna have to work very hard to, to limit global warming and to limit the impacts on the polar regions. A lot of that's already locked in. Um, and that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much for your time. It's very strange giving a talk to yourself. And I think Katrina might come in now. Thanks, Mark. That was super interesting. Um, and I thought you might like to know, we have got folks watching from Edinburgh, Dorset, Fife. Wow. Um, yeah, so that they've joined us from, from all over, which is great. All I have is a cat. <laughs> and we have had a few questions come in. Uh, Dane had to dash off back to work, but uh, they're going to watch this when they finish. Um, so they would like to know, is there anywhere in the world that is freezing over to compensate the ice melts? Um, is there anywhere the earth is freezing over to compensate? Absolutely not. 
there are regions, small regions, where uh, there will be uh, localized climate variations. So almost all of the glaciers on the planet are in retreat, but some are increasing in, in ice. And that's because as the weather patterns change, snowfall is moving to different areas. But if you add up all of the things that are growing with all of the things that are melting, it is unfortunately relentlessly downward. Doesn't bode well for the future, does it? <laughs> It, it's our future. It's the one we made and we're going to have to cope with it. What, what we need to do is to not wait and start, start action, I think. Absolutely. Um, so that actually ties in quite nicely with uh, a question from Chris. Um, they say, Mark, do you think the pandemic has had any effect on the pole climates? And will we see that anytime soon, uh, good or bad effects? Do I think a pandemic will have had a, a, an effect? Um, possibly. The, 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 the interesting thing about, and I don't mean interesting in the sense, um, and I mean interesting in a science sense, pandemic has been a disaster for everyone. Um, we shut down all of our emissions and we switched it off. But if I look at my local environment in London, for the first four months of, of lockdown, almost no cars were on the road. And now, because people are back at work, it's, it's now much worse than it ever was before the pandemic because there are so many more cars and people won't use uh, uh, public transport. And I kind of wonder if the same sorts of things will happen on a larger scale. We can see that emissions have been slowed, but one year will just be like a, a weather event what we really need is sustained changes to make it happen. But what we have shown is, is how we can respond to a global problem very quickly, uh, given uh, the right uh, factors driving it. And I'm not suggesting that I would like these factors to happen again from a climate sense, but you know, people understand now that we can actually change things. So will it make a long-term difference? I don't think it will. Will it, will it make a difference that's measurable? I'm certain that there'll be papers that show that there has been a difference, just like satellites now can measure the changes in uh, uh, nitrous dioxide pollution over certain cities as industrial plants got switched off. I think we've, we've been able to show that we can respond quickly. And we saw a lot of evidence of that. You know, there were pictures in, in the media of um, Los Angeles and how people could actually, you know, see the mountains and everything, whereas they couldn't before from, from all the smog and everything. So we know it's possible. We just have to figure out how to, uh, you know, enact those kinds of things term, don't we? Exactly. And connecting. I mean, part of it, it I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful question because it's, it's implicit in the question that we can change the climate. And the ozone hole in Antarctica taught us that we can change, you know, we can make global changes to, to, to our planet with things that we're doing with, with CFCs. And a really interesting thing with the, the CFCs that come from refrigeration units uh, and certain types of manufacturing are what destroyed the ozone hole. Then we had the uh, Montreal Protocol and responses to that. And we can see the ozone hole recovering but a couple of years ago, some researchers, I uh, can't remember where they're actually from. I think some of them were British uh, and American. They, they calculated that someone was still producing and using CFCs because the ozone hole wasn't responding as quickly as, as it should be to the recovery. But the really good thing about that story is by publicizing it, they've redone the analysis quite recently and shown that actually since they publicized it, the, the use of CFCs has dropped right off. So people suddenly, you know, you have to keep sort of hitting the same thing. But, but connecting people's actions to outcomes on the planetary scale is, is a wonderful thing because it, that's the only thing that people will feel cool about the changes that we need to make. And um, sort of carrying on from the effects of the pandemic, how much of your research has been delayed because of it? Wow, that's a great question. There've been, um, so some of the research programs will have been uh, cancelled, but 
the, the, the real impacts will be on the uh, people involved in the research in terms of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Quarantining, that's it. So people have been going out much earlier and quarantining before going on trips. And some researchers from Leeds University that were involved, they were, I showed a picture at the beginning of the talk of this German ship called Polarstern. Uh, last year, Polarstern uh, was frozen into the Arctic Ocean and drifted all the way across through the whole Arctic winter in 2020. Uh, an amazing piece of research and some researchers from, from Leeds were involved in it. Um, and, you know, they had to go out and they got stuck on the ship for a very long time uh, because they didn't want to exchange personnel like they, they, they would have planned to because they didn't want to bring COVID onto the ship. And that was, of course, before we really understood COVID, before we had a vaccine. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it will have delayed some work. But I would say as well um, that in the same way that uh, if you're a, a researcher involved in rockets and, and satellites, if your rocket blows up, that also delays the work. And so in, in, the, in the polar regions, delays are not unusual. I mean, I had projects that were delayed and knocked on for a couple of years throughout my career. But the human cost of that, of people having to be away from their families for much longer and stuff like that is a really big deal. So, you know, I mean, all the people that actually did those things, uh, either luckily or unluckily, depending on your view, I've fallen into the age group where I'm probably too old to go now. Thank you. Um, Ian wants to know, will the 10% increase in vegeta vegetation in the Arctic region have much effect on absorbing CO2 or is it neg negligible? Uh, so it, this, this, this is a brilliant question and it's the sort of question I wish I had my colleagues involved in me. In the Open University, we have a space research uh, sec unit, the space research uh, special area. Um, and Cadmium Massink in the space research area is actually using the satellites to look down. And it may be that the increase is more short term cycling of carbon between the, uh, between the atmosphere and the plants. So if it grows quickly and dies quickly, it just cycles. To, for it to have a big climate impact, you have to take the carbon out of the system. And that's the thing that Cadmium is involved in trying to understand and what that means. But it's astonishing to think that, yeah, 10% increase in some areas of, of the Arctic plant growth over just 30 years. I mean, it is just quite amazing, human lifetimes. So, so it could. It, it's a very live area to be working on. Um, and we've got a couple more questions we'll try to squeeze in here. Uh, Petrina would like to know what, if anything, can individuals do to make a difference? I, 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 I've said I'm, not a, uh, I'm an optimist. And I think the biggest thing that we can do is to make our cares about what's happening in the polar regions known. If you look, if you think back to Blue Planet 2, which was a OU BBC co-production, the government started enacting all sorts of changes into things like plastics because public, the public were angry about plastics in the oceans and understanding the impacts. And it's the same with the Arctic and the Antarctic. If we have the position that it's natural or it's such a bad thing, we can't do anything about it, then governments won't explore that. But also, I would also make the connection to the previous questions where it was talking about COVID and the lockdown, in lots of ways, our life got a lot better when it wasn't full of pollution and stuff like that. Local changes and local enhancements in our environment will have planetary effects if everyone's doing it. So I would say um, be noisy, please. Um, and we'll take one last question here from Vlad. Uh, in your opinion, and based on existing scientific background, how much can carbon negative technology help in the short to midterm for a drastic reduction of CO2 emissions? Um, again, um, I'm a ice person. It's the answer. It, there's, there's, we have to come up with carbon negative, uh, you know, ways of removing carbon from our, from our atmosphere. We, 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 we really have to. It's not enough to, you know, I, we have colleagues in, our, in the university, Katrina, who, who 
get very angry if you talk about things like net zero because they argue it's a myth and and you know we have to do better than that and 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 so yeah carbon removal and and and, and storage is is got to be the answer or one of the major contributes which means of course there's a fantastic industry uh, potential there how do we get involved in that and that's what that daily express thing was all re really about join the green revolution if britain was to pioneer those sorts of and the people that do pioneer those technologies wow that's good for the planet that's and good for all of us so great question to finish up on well it's just gone one o'clock now so um i'd like to thank everybody for joining us and watching um, I'll, I'll pop an email address in the comments. So if we didn't get to answer your question, send them over and I'll ask Mark to write you a short response. And so thanks again, everyone. Um, I'll also pop a link into the other British Science Week events that we've got on this week. And I hope you can join us for more of them. Thank you. Thanks very, very much. Thank you. Have a nice day.